Good afternoon, and welcome to the Historical Perspectives Elective. I'm pleased to uh, welcome our next moderator, a War College Professor of National Security Affairs and the Dean of Academics, Dr. Rick Norton. Over to you, Rick. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to Historic Pringle Auditorium. This is the very stage which Theodore Roosevelt gave some of his more important nautical speeches. I like to think that perhaps even uh, Mahan himself may have trod these boards. In keeping with that academic tradition, I have the pleasure and privilege of presenting or moderating today's panel. We're going to hear, I think, really interesting presentations. I encourage you to look at the biographies of our panelists in some detail in the, uh, the program. But without further ado, if we can, uh, let's see if we can get our, our first presenter on board. Ah, I've been given the power. Thank you, sir. I've been given the power to call an audible, uh, not to put any pressure on uh, Colonel Jody Prescott and uh, uh, C Commander Salamu Torani, but we would very much like to hear Iran, gender inequality, climate change, and environmental security. Over to you. Thank you very much. I, and I had a joke planned. I thought I was originally going first, and I was going to say I have the coveted position of going right after lunch, and I thought I was going to lose the joke, <laughs> but I got the joke back, so <laughs> lucky me. Um, so uh, Professor Prescott and I have co-authored a paper on gender inequality in Iran and the impacts of climate change and environmental degradation. And for my part, I thought it's important to understand the discrimination women currently face in Iran um, by reviewing women's rights pre- and post-Islamic revolution. And this is particularly interesting after hearing Dr. Hudson's presentation uh, this morning. So I'd encourage you to take note of um, how the laws that are focused on marriage and the household change pre- and post-Islamic revolution. So during the 1960s and throughout the majority of the 1970s, women's rights in Iran were expanding. Um, and uh, they were comparable to uh, women's rights in North America, Western Europe. Um, and there was uh, some notable events that happened in the first half of the 20th century that kind of propelled the women's rights movements. And these events included an introduction of a constitution, the introduction of a parliamentary system, and the reign of the Pahlavi dynasty from 1921 to 1941 and again in 1953 to 1979. When Iran entered the 20th century, there were monumental reformations and modernization. This period is typically referred to the Apocal Constitutional Revolution, and it brought with it the introduction of a parliamentary system. These were the precursors, the precursors for these reforms stemmed from state problems that existed throughout the 19th century which were set off by an economic crisis that occurred in 1904-1905. The Iranian constitution, um, when, it took, uh, when it was put into force, included a Bill of Rights, equality before the law, freedom of speech. Um, these rights were written down and provided a foundation on which to build women's rights in Iran, as well as other human rights. Despite these reforms, though, um, Iran continued to be in turmoil for until about the 1920s. And in, in 1920, it was actually considered a failed state. And this uh, provided an opportunity for General Reza Khan um, to take control of Tehran, which he did in a coup in 1921. General Khan, who would later become known as Reza Shah Pahlavi of the Pahlavi dynasty, was really instrumental to uh, the women's rights movement in Iran in, at that time. He had did certain things when he uh, took power. Uh, he had ordered uh, uh, the police not to harass women uh, who didn't have their hair covered or harass women who were speaking to men in public. Um, so that kind of set the stage. And Reza Shah also pro promulgated laws um, that were modeled on the Napoleonic, Swiss, and Italian codes. Um, and then in between uh, Reza Shah and then when his son uh, took over, there was a brief period that uh, Mossadegh had ruled uh, Iran. But for in terms of women's rights, it's not really that 
you know, relevant. Uh, but Mossadegh, uh, he um, loses power in the coup of 1953, and Reza Pahlavi, Pahlavi's son takes over as the Shah of Iran until the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Um, now, people are familiar with Reza Pahlavi, but what some people might not know is that he had a twin sister. And his uh, twin sister, Asha Pahlavi, was a strong advocate for women's rights in Iran and had a great deal of influence over her brother. And so we see that by 1963, women have received the right to vote run for office, become lawyers, and eventually judges. And when we talk about uh, inclusion and like substantive inclusion, you want women to be in roles where they get to be the decision maker. So being in Congress, being a judge. Um, and most notably, in 1967, the Family Protection Act was passed. And this disallowed polygamy disallowed a presumption of child custody to the father. And you heard actually Dr. Hudson uh, talk about when she was speaking to um, the uh, council, uh, the member of Congress from Afghanistan and how she was saying, well, my husband can just divorce me and he gets the kids. And that was what it was like prior to um, the 1967 Family Protection Act in Iran. Um, that had changed this and also pro and it provided a legal structure on how to uh, obtain a divorce. In addition, it raised the age of marriage up to 15 years old. In 1968, Farah, uh, Farah Parsa was uh, first elected in Iran to cabinet. And by 1975, another woman was appointed to cabinet, Mahnaz Afkami. Several women were appointed to the judiciary, including Nobel Peace Prize winner Shreen Abadi. And by all accounts, it seemed like, hey, we're on a trajectory for equality, um, maybe not substantive equality, but some equality between men and women in Iran uh, by the mid-1970s, um, especially in the fields of economic and political activity. But much of the progress that was made in women's rights in 1960s and 1970s were quashed with the 1979 uh, Islamic Revolution. A priority task, and I, I mean, I think uh, this is diabolical, a priority task in the first year of the Islamic Revolution was to introduce a new constitution. And by 1980, a new constitution uh, existed in the Islamic Republic of Iran. Uh, and in the preamble, the Constitution directs that, quote, the family is the fundamental unit of society within which women will recover their precious function of motherhood, end quote. Um, women were again forced to wear veils and encouraged to wear chador soon post-revolution. All female judges were either fired or unable to sit within the first year of the Islamic Revolution. You'll see that right now Iran does have some female judges, but they're not ultimate decision makers. And it's usually in courts related to family um, uh, law. So really, it doesn't matter if you're a judge, if your decision doesn't uh, uh, isn't the final decision. They're like interlocutory decisions, if I could say it another way. Um, uh, the Family Protection Act uh, was repealed. The age of marriage was lowered to 13 for girls, but of course, with uh, the father's permission, they can marry even earlier than that age. Polygamy for men was, again, permitted. Divorce without a legal framework was permitted. And child custody as of the right uh, to the father uh, were reintroduced. Uh, and so there were repeated instances of human rights violations against women and girls, uh, which were permissible under the Islamic constitution um, and the Islamic penal code and the new laws allowed for stoning women to death in cases of adultery and permitted honor killings. Um, and this is, I again, raise the issue of the new constitution because you can understand that now any other laws or acts or regulations you want to pass are going to be restricted because you can't violate the constitution. Um, and so since 1979, women have protested um, and other people, not just women in Iran, for their rights, but nothing really has been as um, significant as the 16th September 22, 2022 killing of Masa Amini, which would ignite a push for women's rights in Iran that was really unprecedented. This is, of course, the Women Life Freedom Movement, a movement for women's rights that transcended, and this is important, against other divisions, divisions among income, religion, urban, rural, 
rural and cultural identi identity partitions. Uh, the regime, of course, responded to the protests with increased ex executions, increased brutality. Yet there was a significant shift in Iran and women in Iran, especially in Tehran, regularly appear without a, a hijab. Now, while the regime has attempted to stop this trend through street cameras, facial recognition, software fines, and guards trolling subway stations, these uh, initiatives have proved unsuccessful. In addition to the threats that I've just discussed, other aspects to the way the Islamic Republic functions in Iran that impacts discrimination against uh, or that impacts the discrimination women face um, is uh, um, exist. And one of these aspects is environmental change and climate change. But I'll let my colleague, Professor Prescott, uh, speak to what the Islamic Republic has done there. Thank you, Sally. The extreme gender oppression of the Islamic Republic is occurring at the same time that Iran is really starting to register the impacts of climate change. Like much of the Middle East, North African area, Iran has been experiencing a general trend toward a drier, warmer climate punctuated by more variable and more extreme precipitation events. Iran seeks self-sufficiency in food while its population has increased significantly since the beginning of the Islamic Republic. This creates water scarcity, which is exacerbated by nationwide surface water mismanagement and over extraction of groundwater for crops. Urban areas have grown tremendously because of rural outmigration and population increase. Climate, physical geography, and ineffective air pollution controls combine to make Iranian cities some of the world's most polluted. Iranian scientific studies already show gender differentiated health effects of air pollution. Climate change effects are amplifying the negative effects of air pollution. Climate change effects are amplifying the environmental damage caused by water mismanagement. The gender differentiated impacts of these trends will likely compound into desperate impacts upon women and girls. For example, Iran has a weak social welfare system. When the family members become ill, Women and girls will be expected to take care of them if the families cannot hire private caregivers. This will keep women who are already marginalized in the Islamic Republic's economy at home with fewer resources to take care of their families. Although up until now, girls still receive a high level of education, they will likely not be able to attend school as regularly or keep up with their studies as well. To fully understand the scope of the Islamic Republic's oppression of Iranian women, we must factor in the compounding effects of climate change and environmental degradation upon them, effects exacerbated by flawed political priorities in water management, food production, and air pollution control. From an operational perspective, the question then is, so what? To that, I suggest considering what this case study means in terms of non-kinetic and kinetic targeting in an area of operations with these characteristics and creating a gender analysis that is actually relevant to these conditions. For Iran, there is a wealth of Iranian scientific data that would support this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sure there's information there for questions. Um, and thank you very much for being on time. That's very impressive in any presentation. Uh, we next turn to Dr. Mary Thompson Jones and, um, um, who is going to talk about um, Arctic explorers and national security. Um, I think I'll find this a fascinating topic. Mary, over to you. Great, thank you. So I'm going to tell you briefly the story of five women, two of whom are indigenous, three of whom are Western. And my task is to persuade you that these early women Arctic explorers made a substantial contribution to North American national security by building domain awareness. Uh, by contrast, their male Arctic explorers were often looking for national honor, personal glory, what I call latitude attainments, who could be farthest north. They might have been looking for the Northwest Passage. Uh, and they tended to characterize their experiences in man versus nature sagas. Uh, the women had an entirely different experience in the Arctic. 
And I found that their quest for knowledge laid a foundation for a wider understanding of um, what was often a little understood and often a highly mythologized region. Performance of that is different for assessing the indigenous women's contribution as opposed to the Western women's contribution. Uh, I won't belabor the quote here, which you can read for yourself, uh, but the concept of being a wayfinder is a key aspect of the Inuit lived experience. And the photograph here is of an Inuit woman standing next to Knut Rasmussen, whose uh, legendary fifth Thule expedition was uh, one of the major landmarks in Arctic exploration. Domain awareness meant something different in terms of Western women's contributions. Uh, photography, as I mentioned before, uh, was something that these women had in common. They were wealthy enough to be able to invest in state-of-the-art in that period, photographic equipment. Uh, they also had an education. They had some rudimentary scientific knowledge, and they were able to work in cartography, mapping, um, in some cases, botany, specimen collection as well. And across the board, they wanted to lecture and write about their experiences, which added another layer to how they contributed to domain awareness. So I mentioned five women. Uh, and one of the things you'll notice in the photographs of all five women is that I show them to you two ways as they wanted to be portrayed. Uh, in all cases, interestingly, both for the indigenous women as well as the Western women, they wanted to be photographed in two different dress styles. In the case of Tukulitu, first woman we'll be talking about, you see her there appearing in Western garb, and then uh, you see a wood carving of her on the uh, expedition with uh, Charles Francis Hall, who was the captain of the ill-fated Polaris. Uh, Tukulitu is someone we know a lot about because she lived in Great Britain and Connecticut. Uh, she was exhibited at Barnum exhibitions, uh, but more importantly, from the point of view of domain awareness, she served as a tractor. She was often out in front of the dogs. She found a pathway through the ice. She taught Hall a lot about survival in the Arctic. And as a result, he was able to accomplish some things, including debunking the notion of an open polar sea. Uh, they reconnoitered more than 700 miles of coastline, compiled new data on a lot of scientific aspects of the expedition. Next up is another Inuit woman. In this case, we're talking about Anaru Lungak. Uh, she was uh, part of Knut Rasmussen's uh, Fifth Thule expedition. She was Greenlandic. Rasmussen was half Danish, half Greenlandic. And for him, the most important aspect was ethnography and learning more about the natives going across the Arctic. Uh, she was a last minute replacement for her husband who died. You see her there in Western garb because after completing the expedition, uh, the trio went across the United States. She actually got to meet President Calvin Coolidge. She was honored in Denmark with a medal and you see a postage stamp of her wearing uh, furs, which would have been what she wore during her 18,000 kilometer trek, which took over three years. She's noteworthy because she was able to gain the confidence of other Inuit women and help with ethnographic investigations. Her sketches of their tattoos remain extant to this day and are published in some of Rasmussen's works. So the idea that Native women were also interpreters and doorways or windows into a culture that might not have been accessible to male explorers is also something that's important to mention with Inuit women. Let's go to the three Western women. Uh, a woman who probably needs no introduction is Josephine Perry, the wife of Robert Perry. Uh, the photo of her in native garb was one for publication purposes, although she did wear 
uh, furs when she was traveling in Greenland. She made several voyages with her husband. However, in her published journal, you see her in Edwardian dress, complete with parasol, standing next to native people. The reason I include her is because, apart from being the wife of Robert Perry, she had a managerial task on this expedition because Perry uh, had a disastrous accident in which he broke his leg early on in the expedition, all the bones in both bones in his lower leg, and he was incapacitated for close to two months. She had to take on the management of both the American staff and the native staff and make a lot of decisions. Uh, importantly, she popularized this. She was a celebrity in her day. She wrote about it. She returned to Greenland on a secondary voyage and gave birth to their first child, wrote about that in a best-selling book called Snow Baby, uh, the story of Marie, their daughter. Next up is a Scotswoman, Isabel Wiley Hutchison. Um, she focused on the North American Arctic and was keen to live and be with native people, first in Greenland and then across Canada and finally in Alaska. Uh, she took an incredible number of specimens as well as photographs and some of her very primitive but viewable movies of the uh, Alaskan or the uh, Greenlandic people are, are still available to be viewed. And then we have Louise Arner Boyd, uh, a really interesting woman from California, a socialite who was independently wealthy, as was the case with Hutchison. She remained single all her life. She went on seven voyages. And what's interesting is that she became such an expert on Greenland at a time when the United States did not have any expertise on Greenland because Denmark had run it as a closed colony. Uh, she uh, was called upon by the U.S. government because after the Nazi invasion of Denmark, there was great fear in the U.S. that uh, the Nazis would take over Greenland. It was valuable because of its meteorological stations, also for its ports, for a cryolite mine, many other reasons. Uh, Boyd did an extensive amount of work, uh, which was early intelligence work for the U.S. government in helping decide where ports should go, where airplane, uh, airport runways should be built, and her mapping ability was extraordinary along with her photogra photographic ability. So I have to wrap this up. Uh, why does this matter? Uh, I think we can make the case for indigenous knowledge. Uh, it's newly important since Biden's White House Arctic strategy, the first one in 10 years, uh, which in its very first pillar, talks about the importance of consulting and including native knowledge and native people in decisions that are made about the Arctic. It's also important because of climate change. Uh, the documentary evidence that these women left behind provides a baseline and a data point which can be compared 100 years later in terms of shoreline, coastline, uh, habitats of flora and fauna, et cetera, and I think that this is one of the underappreciated aspects that the women have contributed to domain awareness. I'll leave you with the photograph that was taken by Isabel Wiley Hutchison. This is a village in Achu, which is at the end of the Aleutian Islands uh, off the coast of Alaska. And you can see in the bottom part of the photograph, the village there, this uh, was just before the Japanese invasion of Atu and neighboring Kiska. The inhabitants of the village, which Hutchison also photographed, uh, sadly were deported by the Japanese and interned in Japan, where they subsequently, many of them died, and they did not come back. So yet again, we have an example of documentary evidence, a photograph that was a point in time which adds greatly to our historical knowledge, as well as, I think, to domain awareness. Thank you. Sorry I went over. Thank you, Mary. Now, hopefully, we'll be able to talk to uh, Colonel um, Cornelia and... Uh, Does that work now? Cornelia Weiss. If, oh, okay, Cornelia, can we hear us and can we hear you? I can hear you all. I don't know if you can hear me. No, Good. that's perfect. And right. the next 10 minutes are all yours. 
Thank you very much. Okay, so before I start today, permit me to foot stomp. History matters. It matters so much that the US military has perhaps, what, over 1,000 historians? And my plea today to leadership, and that's all of you, task your historians to discover, excavate, research, write, talk, publish, and educate about buried pre and post UN Security Council Resolution 1325 Women, Peace, and Security History. So with that, I will now start. In the Cold War over the German woman, a 1949 Washington Post article proclaimed, this country's most strategic move, one that the Soviet Union is unlikely to duplicate, is to bring influential German women here and let them freely see all of American life, end quote. And the first group of leaders that the U.S. Army Reorientation Program enabled to be brought to the U.S. was not men, it was women. So why or reorientation? Well, the U.S. feared Germany would also start World War III. And in the late 1940s, a belief was that until reorientation occurs, Germany will be potentially dangerous to the peace of Europe. That is, Germans may in the long run be a greater threat than the Russians. And what was reorientation? Well, according to the U.S. military government, quote, the German people will be genuinely reoriented when they can honestly build democracy, when they sincerely believe in democracy, when they can say without hypocrisy, we want democracy because we know it is good for us. Did the reorientation program work? Hmm. When we think about who's threatening the peace of Europe today, do we think Germany or do we think Russia? So let's go to 1949. Why prioritize women? A belief then was no solution can be adequate that overlooks women. And after all, women formed almost two thirds of the electorate in Germany. Now, the Army Reorientation Program, as one commentator remarked, enabled women leaders to, quote, return to their country and be able to talk about our democracy and what makes it work because they have seen it in action and take with them ideas they have gained from observation. These German women leaders, they spent eight weeks in the U.S. And in a 1949 version of public-private partnering, the U.S. Army paid travel and per diem, and the League of Women Voters, through the Carrie Chapman Cat Memorial Fund, created, coordinated, and carried the program. It, take, it took place not only on the East Coast, but also in a U.S. heartland, Bloomington, Indiana. And these German leaders, they saw democracy in action on the national, state, and local level. They all had a hand in rebuilding Germany because as one League of Women voters stated, these women will have visited here and seen how our organizations work. And German leaders also witnessed democracy within families. From US fathers changing diapers on the multi-day ship voyage to the US, to US women publicly voicing opinions different from that of their husbands at public debates. And the German women leaders also got to engage with people remembered today like Eleanor Roosevelt to people seemingly forgotten, but also very relevant today. Like Dr. Marion Cuthbert, years before a Georgia governor had begun his burning of the books by burning first Marion Cuthbert's biography of Juliet Derricott, the first woman trustee of Talladega College. Now, Derricott, Derricott died in 1931, the day after a local hospital denied her treatment for a serious injury because it, quote, did not treat Blacks. So why care today about the 1949 reorientation program? As you all know, the Women, Peace and Security Act of 2017 states, the US should be a global leader in promoting the participation of women in conflict prevention and post-conflict relief and recovery efforts. Yet one need look no further 
than the United States government, Women, Peace, and Security congressional reports detailing the actions that the U.S. is taking to implement the Women, Peace, and Security Act to realize that the U.S., some three quarters of a century ago, was light, hair, light years ahead of today. Now, one effect of the most strategic move by the U.S. was enabling a first step in dismantling the leadership gender gap imposed by the 12 years of Hitler blackout. In 1952, the West German federal parliament had 32 women out of 400 members. In contrast, in 1952, the U.S. had Congress, the U.S. Congress had eight women of a little over 530 members. You do the math. However, subsequent programs during the Cold War give the appearance that the U.S. believed it had checked the box with regard to women leaders. The Eisenhower Exchange Fellowships, the most effective international exchange program leader for leader in the world, restricted its program to only men. And programs that did not limit eligibility to only men were, however, still overwhelmingly men's programs. A 1963 study by the U.S. Advisory Committee on International Education and Cultural Affairs found the emphasis placed on selecting men, and that is 80% of the recipients were men, and of the women selected, the emphasis was not on selecting women leaders. Imagine what the world could be like today if exchange programs had not been restricted against women leaders. And what about international exchange programs for leaders today? Since we are at the Naval War College, let us ask, beyond the question of whether its population of US students and faculty is gender balanced, does the international program give the appearance of excluding women? In conclusion, the United States with this history excavated, has the opportunity in implementing the Women, Peace and Security Act of 2017 to revitalize the forgotten legacy of the Army Reorientation Program, making as its first priority, the combat against anti-democratic gendered leadership gaps. I thank you. Thank you very much, Colonel Weiss, that was excellent. One of the prerogatives of the, the, the moderator is to be able to say something about the conversation. I'd like to start off by giving a nod to Cornelia and her opening statement that history counts. It does indeed. And one of the things that links these papers, I believe, is a look back, and in some cases, recovering historical information that has somehow been submerged over time. Mary's work on women in the Arctic, I think was absolutely fascinating. Cornelia's work, Resurrecting This Program, that talks about bringing German women to the United States in order to break the bonds of Hitlerism, fascinating. Um, and I hope that this would stir additional interest not only in the papers, but in the topics at large. There's also a component of these papers, particularly, I think, the Iranian one, that touches on culture, which ties directly back to our keynote speakers, a spectacularly moving address, and the importance of culture and understanding these things we are looking at. The, uh, the bringing of women to the United States from Germany is clearly an effort to change cultural norms and apparently was successful, at least anecdotally, by the, the results of Cornelia reports. There will be a huge issue with Iran in terms of new cultural norms or return to cultural norms that are going to prove very difficult, I think, to break. And I think the, the example of my daughter and Lou's less about Sharia than I did, and Sharia was an ancillary to my legal education. It's fascinating. And then in... And uh, Dr. Thompson Jones's presentation, this the idea of the almost a cultural collision where uh, indigenous cultures were able to teach Europeans how to survive in their particularly de uh, demanding environment, but also that that bizarre intertwining of cultures that we see in women explorers from the West and indigenous populations. You see something similar, by the way, in a small area, uh, a remarkable woman named Mary Kingsley, who was a Victorian explorer in Africa. Uh, today, the Kingsley Award is still given in part of tropical disease. Um, and much like the parasol picture, pictures of Miss Kingsley in, uh, in Equatorial Africa, she's always in Victorian garb. And uh, at least one theory thought she didn't get malaria because of the difficulty of mosquitoes and penetrating that particular costume. 
it'd be also remiss of me if we didn't look at at least this issue of how do these topics tie to national security? Um, not only are the examples, I think, of soft power, although, Mary, if I may be so bold, this operational the, uh, domain awareness, that's if that's soft power, that's tinged with a rather sharp edge to it. Um, one of the little known aspects of World War II is we there were wars, there were battles fought in Greenland. Uh, the Germans had successfully infiltrated meteorological stations because knowing that weather patterns in the Western Atlantic was so critically important to them as they moved east. Uh, however, I think the, um, the the national security pieces of this, certainly the idea that you could change a population's attitude. And this will tie into the MacArthur piece too, which I'm proud to say, at least in some classes, is included in the many things that the Generalissimo did when he when he became the imperial leader of Japan, the de facto imperial leader of Japan. Um, but that's a really interesting aspect. And I think particularly when you tend to look at kinetics, we forget the very real national security components of these uh, that are that are exemplified through the three presentations we've seen today. Um, finally, not to not to serve as an excuse maker for my my institution, but rather to bear its shield proudly. I am very proud to say that in my department alone, um, we have, uh, I think, uh, two of the leading women experts in uh, Paul Mill and Mill and Sid Mill relationships, Dr. Jessica Blankshane and Dr. Lindsay Cohen. Um, and uh, in, among, a, among their, I think you would find our curriculum to be at least 50%, if not more, with such features as Dr. Riza Brooks. So it is an area, I think, that improvements need to be made, but maybe even are being made. Now, since we have a little bit of time, is there anybody on the panel with, who would like to have, uh, you know, a last shot? No, no. Cornelia? Well, I want to thank you. And, and again, I'm going to go back to where I started from and the foot stomping. The military has enormous, an enormous resource in its historians. And why not? task them to address WPS. Uh, you, you know, the, the difficulty of getting information from FOIA. So I have sent out numerous FOIA requests to actually ascertain the number of historians that the military employs. Uh, but the best guesstimate I've received is over a thousand. So imagine if a thousand historians got a tasker to address WPS. Imagine what could be found. So thank you. And with that, I think our panelists concluded. Thank you. Thank you for those insights, Dr. Norton. Thank you, Ms. Weiss. Let's give a warm round of applause to our panelists for this informative discussion. Thank you so much.